seeing you when you first started out as a fledgling company and now what you've blossomed into, I can't imagine who's doing it any better than this. Let's just say what you're doing is world class. I wouldn't say it if it weren't true. It's just obvious that when you put this type of love and work into something that is going to impress even, let's say, a tough customer as myself that grew up around this work. You've put a lot of hard work into it and now it's paid off. I think that anybody that is in league with you is in very good hands. Some of our um, accolades, we've been in obviously Forbes, Vogue, GQ, obviously you know this guy? Oh yeah. Mr. Christopher Ellis Davis. Yeah, of course. This was the Saatchi show here. So the 22 shadow figures were lined up like a bit like an army. Wow, I wish I'd have seen that. We had a few goals with this. Uh, mm. One is to showcase the bodies of works that in our mind is quite an important bodies of works because it was like the transition piece. 53 were made by Hamilton or original but we discovered 22 by chance. The goal was to get the other pieces to gravitate towards us. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, since that show, we found a, a bunch more, we now have got 30. Wow. And we're hoping by next year, we're gonna find at least, you know, majority more, or if not all, and then redo the show at Saatchi, but with all the family members back together. I know what to call it. Forbidden City. Like the Chinese, you know, oh, yeah. all the statues of the soldiers that are all lined up. Yeah. Yeah. Richard Hamilton's Forbidden City. That's exactly what it looks like. And those, those are the sentries that are standing looking after the streets of New York or wherever he put them. So it, yeah. Obviously a load of the shadow heads. Uh, that's the one. Mm-hmm. I got this one from Mike Melbourne, Frank Chop Shop. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's quite cool because it's 2017, one of the last rodeos he ever made. Also, the way he used this sort of staccato line on it, I've never seen him do exactly that. He was a bug out. He would just experiment <coughs> with different techniques from day to day. And, and this is something I've never seen him do something quite like that. I, I'd like to have that myself. You know, Beautiful. It, it really is. We're launching this limited edition tonight at the show. Fantastic. So it's a run of 75. We've got the rights to distribute 35 of them in the UK. Mm -hmm. It's a super piece. Have you seen the original of that? Deep Tech? No, but it looks like stuff he did in the 80s. I think this one was from the 90s, but it does look like the 80s. Yeah. It's in the documentary. These, you know, swooshes, there's a few standing shadows or jumpers which have got these kind of swooshes. Yep. In actual fact, Johnny, has actually got an 80s piece camp with, with a very similar design, mm -hmm. which uh, we might be brokering a deal for him on. Johnny's got a good eye. You know, the first thing you commented on the nightlife pieces because of that double glass, with the light piercing through, it's just, it just makes them pop. Oh, absolutely. And, and also, you know, it has what you call in Chinese calligraphy or brushwork, it's the flying whites, where he's moving so quickly that you see those streaks of white paper shining through yeah. and when it, it's backlit like that you can really see the the musicality of how he applied the the paint and you know they fold, fold into a booklet and a case box yeah they fold away they're, they're signed not only on the on the box that it comes with but also signed on the booklet and dated 1985. So oh fold, shit they fold down all the way goes into a booklet my goodness they're numbered out of the 53, signed there. Wow. Numbered, signed there, 1985. Wow. And Nightlife by Richard Hamilton. Mm. And if you really think about it, these works are a bit like Hamilton's life. 53 were made, then they disappeared for mm -hmm. like 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we've discovered the vast majority now wow. are still, still missing, missing members. And what is this, Japanese paper or something? Kimwashi. Huh? Kimwashi, Japanese Kimwashi. It is. Strangely, these bits of uh, fiber do the work of his splatters they too. Are, they, yeah. they, they're atomizing the energy around the figure. How many do you think have been probably destroyed since 85 then? Out of the 53. Out of 53. How many have you become 30. aware of? We've got 30. We're probably thinking maybe probably in the damage loss. 
It's funny too, because he probably started with this, I'm just guessing with this shoulder here, and then the head, he realized he didn't have enough space, and then gave it kind of baby splatters, and it doesn't look weird, it looks kind of cool, well, like, it, yeah. The other thing as well that we didn't know, mm. but on our quest to finding them, mm. is a few years before, he must have had the idea of doing the Nightlife series because he done 10 Nightlife APs, Mm -hmm. on a much thicker paper. Mm. Some of them had booklets, some of them didn't, some mm. of them a bit sort of damaged and destroyed. We found four, mm. so we, one of them is next door. Uh, and then, in 1985, we decided to do the whole body of work. Fantastic. You know, we see these so much, and there's value to these, it's apparent, <coughs> it, it's clear as the nose on your face at this point, and that's what he did on the street. So that's how we first became acquainted with him. But the beautiful series, I think, is something that will live in time. And it's going to take a while for the public to understand that the same guy that did this, this is equally a chamber of his heart. You know, and it just represented a different state of feelings for him. And I mean, what I like is when it looks almost like just a dirty mirror or something. And then you go, oh, but it can also be seen as a landscape because it's, it's all the tumult of like a horse and rider or that you get from that splatter. It's in that murky, you know, movement of those cloudy forms. And um, obviously the, the reference not a lot of people like is, is the blood in a syringe. Yeah. But, you know, he's seeing that day in, day out. It becomes a poetry to him and maybe he did an hour or two without it. And then finally he gets it and it's like, Ah, it's that feeling. Also, I don't know if this is common knowledge, but he said to me that when he do these, that it's meant to look like the paintings that are in rich people's homes in television. He said this on, on my on podcast. The walls, right? Yeah, that when in the background, of, you know, of guy's house, he's talking on the phone and you see in the background, it's always a painting like that. And maybe I've said this too, so I hate to repeat myself, but I remember when I first brought uh, Vladimir Reutfeld by the studio, he, he liked one that was kind of similar to this. And he goes, Richard, I really love this one. And Richard, it looked as good as this to my eye. And I said, I said, yeah, it's a great one. And, and Richard said, oh, not really done with that one. And Vlad was like, look, I'm, I'm leaving to Paris today. I'll, I'll give you 20,000 right now. And Richard looked at it and he, he looked at the money and he's like, you know, next time you come, I'll, I'll save it for you. Let me work on this one more. We came back a week or two later. I mean, I came back and he totally scraped it off and started, I don't know whatever became of that painting, but to me, it was at a state it could have been sold. It could have been hung next to a rider or a, a Turner. Yeah. And yet he, he just wouldn't, he, was, he wasn't satisfied until it said exactly, you know, the, the pitch that he wanted it at. Yeah, like that's the way, you know, I sometimes get a call about fakes. And that's the way I, I, I know a fake, is that it's just dashed off. And um, my father used to use the comparison of um, Rolls Royce, that when they paint a Rolls Royce in the factory, apparently sometimes they give it one coat and the guy comes and he goes, okay, it's a Rolls Royce. Sometimes they do it 10 times. And it's the same process that you would think it's the same paint, it's the same material. But Richard was like that. And, um, you know, like a painting like this, he might have done it in 15 minutes. It doesn't mean it's a 15 minute painting. It means all of his skills were such that he was able to do something very spontaneously and it came out of him. But believe me, if he didn't capture that gesture, he's going to rip it up and roll out a whole new sheet of paper. So he was very determined to keep up a certain standard at all times. Even if he needed rent to pay or whatever, were, there were those moments. So the, the art truly came first. It wasn't his wants and needs, it was the art. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's unusual because people will talk about his addiction as like, it had him. Now I think he had his addiction and he always, that was always secondary to his work. You know, he never, I, there's artists I can think of that had great careers early on 
and then discovered a sort of commercial following and then started to replicate themselves and would just do stuff in their own style. And Richard never did that. I mean, as I like come in here and I'm looking at these works I'd never laid eyes on before, I'm like, oh wow, just other themes and variations of ideas I might know, I might be familiar with, but these are wholly new works for me. It was, that's the way he felt at that moment on that day. And Richard though, he stumbled into certain motifs that he loved and really spoke to his soul. Um, no two rodeo paintings are the same, no two shadows are the same, and no two beautiful paintings are the same. So it, it's really like a pleasure to walk in here and see your collection. You've really got some gems here too. So we are at our home, Woodbury House. We long last got the, uh, the, the gentleman next to me, Nima Labrizio, over from, from New York. It's been a bit of a challenging time over the last 12, 18 months because of Corona. And we wasn't too sure whether we could either us go over to you or you come over here, but you're finally here. So yeah. welcome to our second home, Woodbury House. Thanks for having me. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, I got introduced to you via Annie Val Morvida, who owns the Richard Hamilton Foundation. And when you came down here and we had some lunch and when you left, I thought to myself, one day I'm probably going to do business with this man. Um, you know, for the obvious reasons, because you're in the Shadow Man documentary, you obviously know your stuff. Your dad was a great Rick Labrizi. Um, and I think you're, you're, you're a good man and you've got, um, you know, a lot of knowledge about the street art sector, specifically about Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So looking at, remembering when you first came here to now, how has this space changed? Well, it was like uh, the mustard seed. At first, there was just a few things, and now it's really blossomed into a full-blown cathedral for the man's work. And when you put this much love and care into something, clearly it's not just a, a business. I mean, hopefully you're also functioning as a business, and it's not a, a charity after all, but that it really it gives the right type of feeling to his work, to see it all collected like this and so lovingly put together that I think it's, it's a great foundation for not only just a business, but a place where, you know, a person could come in here and reflect on his life's work. And it's like a perpetual museum show. <laughs> you know? um when we have clients come come in and uh you know over the last few years certainly since hamilton's death and certainly since the release of his shadow man documentary which won an award and it's on amazon etc we've had we've been inundated and in the last few weeks it's even ramped up more because of the new york times there's also a gentleman that i've just interviewed who didn't put a name to his face he, he was wearing a mask and he's been paying homage to Hamilton by replicating the shadow figures. What's your view on that? Because he said to me that he's had 80% people supporting him, but he's had also 20% people that are discouraging him or actually being quite personal, saying that he shouldn't be doing it. What, what's, what's, your, what's your view on that? Well, you know, like Cat Williams said, if you have 10 player haters Today, you better work on getting 20 player haters by next year. You know, I think it's a sign that you're doing something. <clears throat> you're supposed to ruffle feathers, first of all. So that's no indicator of someone's doing something wrong. Somebody's always going to hate anybody that begins any type of enterprise. When I first met this gentleman in New York, we were introduced as someone that was carrying on Hamilton's legacy. Of course, I had my doubts, uh, you know, at first, until I met and I started speaking with him, I said, oh, he's obsessed. I mean, it's an, it's an earnest venture for him. And I think the Times article pointed this out. If it also happened to come into league with uh, a means of uh, promoting Hamilton's work as well, I don't think that that was his original impetus in beginning that work. I think he's just an obsessed... It's almost like what, what they call it, fan fiction or something, you know. He and also, I brought two people around that scene. One was Richard's bosom friend Duncan, who lived with Richard, 
And another was Al Diaz, that was Basquiat's uh, partner in the same old graffiti and also a street artist. Who's been on my podcast as well. Great. So I, Al, Al's, Al, like myself at first, was like, I don't know. I don't know if this is kosher. And then he met the guy and he was like, yeah, okay. I mean, he's, he's one of us. He's, he's a nut. I mean, because <laughs> when you did street art, there was no guarantee that anybody would see you, know you, give you money give you a hug or a kiss it was more likely the police would arrest you or you'd be you know your stuff would disappear the next day also as far as an homage goes when i started reflecting on it i said well richard's work was always very multifaceted there's an art component and there's also a social commentary component and i think that it's fair game to carry on the social commentary. And, you know, like Jay-Z said, the streets is watching. It's, you know, to have these shadowy figures out there on the street, it says something to the passers-by, like, hey, mate, you might be going to buy a cashmere sweater, but out there somewhere there's some creepy guy watching everything that you do. And, you know, I think it was the conscience uh, or the the dark mind of a dangerous New York at that time. And I think that we're not any better for the fact that all the Hamiltons have disappeared off of the streets. And for somebody to put them back in place, even if they're not the exact hand of the artist, I welcome that. The, um, us as a, as a brand, as I mentioned on my podcast, and I've said this plenty of times to people, um, we are not from the art market. We found ourselves right place, right time. I got introduced to Andy by complete chance. Mm-hmm. And it was a bit like the stars ha- had aligned, certainly for me. I'm the founder of, of the brand and you know I like to present, I like to sell, I like to do marketing. And the moment I found this narrative of Hamilton, it was so my calling. I, I mean, I knew straight away. It, it, there was like a s- central feeling I got which is this is where I'm meant to be Um, and it's weird because I'm a South London boy miles away from New York miles away from Canada where uh, Hamilton was was born but yet there was something that just the penny dropped with me and I feel that that happens to a lot of people when they come in because most of our clients at the start were what we call investors you know they cared about the bottom line Mm -hmm. but the moment they watch the shadow man documentary the moment they come to our shows the moment they got educated in actual fact they turned from investors to actually more collectors absolutely and they started to really adore and admire and appreciate the different bodies of works by hamilton so i think i've asked you this on the podcast what what would you say is your kind of your more favorite uh, bodies of works by hamilton oh god i mean that's like saying what's your favorite miles davis album you know I, I or like, your favorite child i like it all yeah I like it all, and, and that experience that you're referring to, it, it's, um, I think the spirit of Richard's work has chosen certain people to carry on his legacy, and at this point, it is through finding homes for these works and institutions, and I hope he'll forgive me for saying this, but when I met Andy, he was a bit more of a playboy, and he was doing art shows, but, you know, all the fashion models would show up, it was more of a, a blast, and... Um, I remember that when he first saw Hamilton's work, it was like kind of a love at first sight experience. And something much more serious came out of Andy from that day, and he's become increasingly more involved with Hamilton's legacy ever since. And I think it's, uh, if Andy can be playful, I think this side of him is a much more serious, sophisticated side. And I think what you're referring to, whether you come from this part of town or that part of town, it's kind of irrelevant. I think that Hamilton's work speaks to us all. He's got, he's struck on some universal thing. I mean, we all have a shadow following us around. And I think the fact that that speaks to you and now you're, you've put it on a platform where you're making initiates of other people. I think that that's a, that's a beautiful work to be engaged in. So I had uh, Mr. Ken Moss, he's been here a few times, he's been on my podcast, he's Mm -hmm. a big collector of Hamilton, Mm he's got some fabulous works, I've been really, really powerful, and some unique things. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's got this gun, which was part of the 
mass murder scene, uh, mm. which he got uh, Hamilton gifted to, to him. He's got some incredible stories. And he said something which, which really made me feel good. He said, you know, there was a few brands in America, in New York, that he said used to lead the way for Hamilton. But he said, in his own words, that in actual fact, you are now the brand that is lead, leading the pack. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to fish for compliments, but at the same time, it's nice to, to be, get that validation. I mean, how, where do you see us in like the Hamilton Market, Woodbury House? I would tend to agree, but it's not that I go around visiting uh, other platforms or other venues that do, let's say, similar work. But now, seeing you when you first started out as a fledgling company, and now what you've blossomed into, I can't imagine who's doing it any better than this. So while all comparisons being odious, let's say, let's just say what you're doing is world class. And I wouldn't say it if it weren't true. It's just, you know, obvious that when you put this type of love and work into something that it's going to impress even, let's say, a, a tough customer as myself that grew up around this work. It, it's really, you know, you've put a lot of hard work into it and now it's paid off. And I think that anybody that is in league with you is in very good hands. We, because uh, we're very open and honest and transparent about the fact that I'm not from the art market originally. I just found myself right place, right time. But just like all our investors stroke collectors, once you start learning about this genre, specifically Hamilton and the affiliates, you fall in love with it. I mean, it's physically impossible not to fall in love with this story. I mean, my dad is going to be in the audience tonight and he's a typical geezer, you know. You know, he's like double glazer, you know, rough around the edges. And even him, he's actually acquired two pieces, which, which is amazing. It's like testament to the fact that even if you're not from the art market, but you come across this narrative, you, you can fall in love with it. Um, but the point I was trying to get to is, unlike the gallery model, we never wanted to jump from one thing to the other. Richard Hamilton isn't the flavour of the month for us. This is our life. We've invested not only money into this market, but a lot of time and a lot of passion. And um, we want to keep on pushing the market, telling, telling the wider world and making sure that people don't, who don't know about Hamilton find out about him. Banks is a great artist. Um, he just had a record auction, 18.3 million, I think, at Sotheby's, which I was, which I was at, which is called Love in, Lovers in the Bin. Mm -hmm. We want to get Hamilton on the same line as, as, as Banksy, and I think he can get there. Oh, easily. I mean, I think that whoever, it's either whoever Banksy's working with or whether it's his own ingenuity, but he's positioned himself very well vis-a-vis -vis the art market maybe uh, similar in, in a way to Damien Hirst, where he's navigated that realm uh, very um, intelligently on his own or with his camp. Whereas Richard Hamilton in his time did everything on earth to sabotage himself. It's almost a complete opposite. He wasn't jockeying for position in the art world. Maybe a bit in the 80s, let's say. You know, he was young and handsome and he, he, he might have played the scene a bit, but the Hamilton that I knew personally was like an art hermit. And you almost had to force him to sell you something. Uh, so I think that's kind of an opposite um, paradigm to a Banksy or someone like that, who's really made himself kind of the darling of the art world and can't take anything away from a guy like that. Uh, Picasso was like that. Um, Warhol, to a great extent, was like that. But um, Hamilton was almost contrary to that. Like you could think like a Van Gogh, let's say. Van Gogh used to curse people out on the street. He, he was a madman. And, you know, Hamilton was a bit of a, he was a maverick. So if it weren't for like yourself and Andy and you know, people who have been very careful in collecting his work and putting it in its proper um, place uh, culturally and also financially, uh, that work would never have gotten done. Because if Richard would have lived to be 200, he never would have gotten his shit together, so to speak. Mm.
The main reason why we've got you over here, obviously we're going to be doing some other business as well, but the main reason tonight is number one, to celebrate Richard's life. He Today is it marks the fourth year anniversary of his death. Right. But then also tonight we are at the Hamyard Hotel, which is a world-class hotel, mm -hmm. beautiful hotel. Mm -hmm. There's a 200-man cinema, which we've got 250 people coming to, so we're oversubscribed. We've literally got people who are going to be hanging off the ceilings. Only joking, but... Um, there is loads of people coming um, and they're there to watch the Shadow Man documentary they're also to hear a conversation between you and I a bit like this mm -hmm. Q&A uh, we are uh, launching our first published book for Hamilton and also a limited edition which is a run of 75 so the guests are going to be in for a real treat tonight because wow. there's quite a you know a few things to talk about mm -hmm. um, yeah how excited are you about the, tonight's event I mean it's, it's hard to get me, especially in these kind of post-COVID times. I haven't been traveling at all. And it's hard to get me out of Brooklyn. And I came here with bells on because I really am enthusiastic to join you in celebration of Richard Hamilton. And obviously, you've put this together in such a, a class manner that, um, you know, I'm just I feel honored to be part of it. I can't wait for the um, for, for the conversation live because mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's going to be some pretty pretty significant people in the audience. There's obviously collectors and investors, and mm -hmm. I think I think this is the point. Like, if you can't speak to Hamilton because clearly he's passed away, the next best thing is to speak to the people that used to work alongside him. Mm -hmm. I mean, your dad would have had some incredible stories. Yeah. You've obviously got some incredible stories. People have commented lots about our conversation on the podcast and other podcasts I've done with Out Diaz and Days and you know Crash and all, the, all these other people, Mike Melbourne from Frank Chop Shop. But to ask you directly is going to be a real treat for them. And um, I, I think they're going to get a lot of value out of it. Thank you for having me. No problem. Well, look, um, we've got a few hours until it all kicks off. So uh, this is only a brief conversation. And um, I hope everyone's enjoying the conversations and the content. And we're looking to uh, really do some great stuff next year. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.